Well, it's a great pleasure being here. Um, I can clearly see why uh, they're trying to clone Dr. Young Fadoc. Um, she's awesome, and so is Dr. Wexner. No financial disclosures for me. The talks with the cool videos will follow this one, so I thought I'm gonna put the cool pictures. Thank you, Sages, and the um, chair and co-chair. I'm gonna keep the talk simple. The, I'll tell you about what the indications of mobilizing the splenic flexure is, review of literature, evidence for doing it, evidence against doing it, and summary slash take home, or rather take to work points. So why mobilize the flexure if you can't reach, if the colon won't reach the rectum, or uh, another portion of colon won't reach another portion of rectum, uh, then we have to mobilize the flexure. I don't think there is any doubt or controversy about this indication for mobilizing the flexure. This is where the controversy starts. It reaches, but it is smaller than what you want in terms of length. This could represent the length of the specimen. It could represent the length of the colon remaining, which you want to anastomose. It is one thing making the colon reach the rectum or another portion of colon reach, so a second portion of the colon, but it is another thing about what length you have. I, I want to dwell a little bit upon this point, meaning let's say you're doing a surgery for low anterior re resection in a patient who has had chemo radiation, the specimen length does matter because there is sigmoid colon which has been radiated, which is thickened, which you can easily anastomose to and leave the OR thinking you did a good job, uh, but the patient may suffer consequences. Similarly, in a diverticulitis patient, you may anastomose to upper sigmoid instead, instead of descending colon, and that may have its own consequences. I'll, I'll go into details later. I, the, the timer is not working, Dr. Wexner. Yeah. Um, so this is where all the controversy started in terms of getting length. Some people thought it was something which could be overcome by surgical judgment, and others thought it to make it routine and mobilize this, uh, the flexure uh, in every case. This although seems to be uh, the same situation, that the colon is, is pulling apart. There is uh, essentially two segments of colon which is trying to, to tug at each other. But here I would say that you have length and you are able to make a connection, but it's just that the anatomy is dictating this traction. This is typically seen when you're doing a transverse colon resection and you have mobilized the hepatic flexure, but the splenic flexure is not mobilized. So I would argue this is also an indication to mobilize the splenic flexure. So there are two groups of surgeons, those who mobilize, the ones on the left, and those who don't. I, this is not intentional, but it seems like those who mobilize are the happier group. I, I don't know if you can tell what my bias is. So, this is an ongoing conflict, this is an ongoing debate, and so the uh, DCR decided to have two groups fight it out in public domain. If you want to read these two articles, they're, they're very nice, very short, and uh, from 2012, I, I would really recommend reading it. If you don't have access, just email me and I'll send you any article that I'm referencing in my talk. <coughs> So mobilizing the flexure does take time. On an average, it takes 40 minutes to mobilize it. And it may be challenging. In fact, uh, in one of the surveys, most surgeons laparoscopically found it to be the most challenging part to mobilize the splenic flexure uh, or the uh, transverse colon. So then why do it? These are the potential advantages. You can get a tension-free anastomosis. There is potentially less chance of leak. This is a very difficult thing to prove. There is less chance of stricture. You'll get longer specimen length and likely better nodal clearance. And the potential disadvantages are injury to the spleen, the potential for vascular injury. I would say the, that is enhanced if there is a lack of <coughs> knowledge of the anatomy or if there is a lack of 
thorough perusal of preoperative um, imaging in this day and age, and of course, over time. So if you review the evidence, you get about 6,000 articles if you look at splenic flexure, and about 1,000 article if, articles if you check for splenic flexure mobilization using the English and the American spelling. And once you go through all of them, you'll, you'll end up with about 100 articles. The quality of studies are, are poor. It's, it's not because people are not trying to study this topic, it's just because of the nature of the beast. No randomized control trials as is expected. Very few large cohorts. And there are a couple of studies with secondary data. I do not think this is something which should be studied with secondary data unless you are looking at incidences and trends. There are a few studies like that, but mostly secondary data is not the way to, to study this topic, in my opinion. There's a lot of noise uh, in, the, in the literature, so you have to be careful uh, about looking at an article, looking at an abstract, and making an opinion. I, I'm just going to use this article to highlight what I mean by noise. Uh, it, it is not a criticism of the authors or the journal. Uh, it is just to, to highlight the problem with today's um, review of literatures. So if you see here, the article says the selective use of splenic flexure mobilization is safe in both lap and open surgeries. But the number of patients who actually had splenic flexure mobilization was 263 minus 216, which is 47. And then they subdivided it into two groups, which means the maximum number of patients that they could have analyzed in one group is not more than 24. I would argue that you cannot make any conclusions from an article like this. Maybe, maybe about safety, that it can be done, but that's about it. So you have to be careful. So what's the data? I'm gonna share with you a few articles which I think shed some light on this topic. This is a cadaveric study from a group in, in Brazil, 20 patients, 20 cadavers. And it clearly shows what we intuitively know, that if you mobilize the splenic flexure, you'll have longer colon, longer specimen, longer end of colon to use. This is a study which um, came out of Singapore <coughs> where they reviewed a total of around 700 patients and they found that the resection margins in cancer are longer, both proximally and distally. This is very important. If I'm a patient with cancer, I would much rather have a, a surgery which is 30 or 40 minutes longer and have better resection margins. So this is a very strong argument for mobilizing the flexure. On a similar note, but extrapolating that same concept, you get more nodes. And in this study, once the specimen length uh, increases in terms, of, in terms of the size of the surgical specimen, you find more nodes. I know it is intuitive, but the data also proves it. This is a difficult thing to prove, to prove causality of leaks. Uh, so we really don't know. Uh, the fact is we don't know if splenic flexure mobilization decreases leak or increases it. There, is a lot, there are a lot of studies out there, but I am not able to assign them a category one evidence status. So it is very hard for me to say that it, it does um, decrease the chance of leak. But logic, I know it is a word we should not use in, in forums like these, but logic would dictate that it would reduce leak rates. And we have objective techniques to assess for vascularity of the colon that you're using. You know, you have Doppler, you have um, modern methods like, uh, um, I, I don't want to use the trade names, but uh, uh, you, you can objectively assess vascularity. And assessment of tension on anastomosis is subjective. There are a few cadaveric studies, but it is very difficult to assess tension intraoperatively. So I would like to say that splenic flexure mobilization takes this aspect out of the picture. I know a lot of people feel very strongly about it, I'm not a physically very strong person, so don't come later on to, to, to hit me. If you do st have strong feelings, then I would refer you to my partner, Dr. Young Fadok, who is also a rugby player. 
This slide may offend people more, but I, I wanted to put it up there. I, I would I'd like you to read it, and I would like to say that tension-free anastomosis is, is a must. It is not optional. It is not something which you do because you want to do it. It is something which all of us should strive to achieve. This is a, a paper from Dr. <coughs> Wexner's group, uh, which points to a very important issue. What, what, what do we do with strictures? All of us have patients who have strictures after surgery, who suffer from constipation, who suffer from, um, from physiological aberrations, possibly because the splenic flexure was not mobilized. How do you study something like that? It is very difficult. Um, this paper, although they had few patients, but it was, it was very good correlative evidence because it was redo patients who had strictures and in all of them, they found splenic flexure was not mobilized in the first operation. Splenic injury, and this is data from Mayo Clinic, 0.45% uh, of patients who had uh, colectomies had splenic injuries, and 0.35% needed a splenectomy. So yes, it is a real problem, and of course, splenic flexure mobilization is the primary risk factor, but it is a smaller problem in the bigger picture, in my opinion. And there is one NIS study, and that is where I think secondary data should be used, which shows that splenic injury has reduced with the use of laparoscopy, and you can all see why that is. In open surgery, it is much easier to injure the spleen. Vascular injury of the severe kind, I think, is avoidable. You have to be, uh, of course, aware of artery of Moskowitz, which I'm sure one of my following speakers will talk about, so I don't want to steal their thunder. So in wrapping it up, the pros of splenic flexure mobilization is you get better margins more lymph nodes, tension-free anastomosis, less strictures, and probably a, a, a smaller chance of a leak. The cons are, I don't think vascular injury is a, is a true problem if, if you plan your operation carefully. It is, but in a very small minority. And chances of, operate, of splenic injury is small. Yes, operative time is something which is the cost of mobilization of the flexure, but I think it is fair to use that as the price to pay for a better surgery. Intangible benefits, standardization of technique. So it is one thing to go into the operating room, resect a tumor or a diseased organ, and then the colon doesn't reach. You have to reposition the patient. You have to mobilize the splenic flexure. You have to bring it down. At, at some points, maybe you have done a resection, it just reaches, you think it is okay, it may not be okay, so it, it leads to a lot of subjectivity. What if we make it standardized and you start the operation with a splenic flexure mobilization, get a better oncological resection, remove the subjectivity? In summary, risk of splenic flexure mobilization is minimal. It has clear advantages. Exact benefit is very difficult to estimate. And so I think it is best to mobilize as a default option in cancer. The exceptions are sigmoid volvulus, rectal prolapse, and a Hartman's procedure. Those are, those are the three operations where I don't uh, routinely mobilize it. Thank you.